From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents George Arliss in Cardinal Richelieu with Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero, Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbrell. Lux presents Hollywood. This is the drama of a man who struggled against enormous odds of force and hatred to bring dignity and greatness to the flag of France. Our play stars George Arliss with Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero, Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbrill. And our guest between the acts is Edward P. Lambert, outstanding Hollywood authority on history and costumes. Our music is conducted by Louis Silvers. This program comes to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the world's largest selling package soap for fine fabrics. Lux is so mild, so pure, it's safe for anything safe in water alone. If you lux your things regularly, your lingerie, stockings, sweaters, and dainty blouses and dresses, you help them stay new looking longer. And a little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. Now, your host and producer of the Lux Radio Theater, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. During America's cradle days, at about the time that Englishmen were planting tobacco and the sovereignty of King James in Virginia, and the Dutch were buying the island of Manhattan at far less than a penny an acre, there spread across every corner of France the shadow of a mighty man, a man named Richelieu. In his youth, Richelieu had worn the plated helmet of a soldier, later the red cap, which proclaimed him a cardinal of the church. Though he never wore a crown, no king ever sat more securely on the throne of France than he, or brought it greater glory. It's the drama of his career that we're about to bring you, with one of drama's most distinguished interpreters, Mr. George Arliss, in the role of the cardinal he portrayed so vividly on the screen. Mr. Arliss comes to us tonight in the company of the girl with the nice arms, for those are the words he used in dedicating his autobiography to her. She's better known as his charming wife, Florence Arliss, whom we'll hear as Marie de Medici. Making his first Lux appearance is the romantic Cesar Romero in the part of André de Pont. Heather Angel, lovely leading lady in a score of films, is Lenore. Montague Love is heard as King Louis XIII. And Douglas Dumbrill, one of the screen's more able specialists in villainy, is Baradar. Now for the play. The Lux Radio Theater presents George Arliss in Cardinal Richelieu. France in the early years of the 17th century was the last stronghold of ancient feudalism. The country was divided into vast domains, ruled over by independent lords. Then in 1628, Louis XIII began to gain authority over his nobles a rise of power brought about by the strength and purpose of one man, the Minister of State, whose name was on everyone's lips. Richelieu, Cardinal Richelieu. He's the savior of France. Richelieu will bring us unity. He'll bring us peace. May heaven bless him. Richelieu. But Richelieu made enemies as well as friends. The nobles, jealous of their lost privileges, gained the ear of Marie de Medici, the king's mother. Through the influence of Anne, Louis's wife, who is no friend of Richelieu, Marie has been granted audience in His Majesty's private apartment. With her comes Count Baradar, a bitter enemy of Richelieu. The king, annoyed at the interruption, turns angrily to Queen Anne. I must say, Anne, you've selected a strange moment to press this matter. My doctors have ordered me absolute quiet, a fact which you, my wife, seem to entirely disregard. I do not disregard it, Louis. But your mother has a message of the greatest importance. I think you should hear her. Well, what is it now, mother? You have persistently refused to see me. While Richelieu is by your side, you will listen to no one, not even your mother. You know you hate me, really. I hate Richelieu, this impudent churchman who works daily to make a king's crown out of his cardinal's hat. Oh, ridiculous. You exaggerate, mother. I wonder if she does. You seem incapable of ruling without his eminence. You'll hold your tongue. I rule as I see fit. You don't seem to realize that we are facing civil war, Louis. Civil war? Are you mad? Do you think that powerful nobles like Normandy and Lorraine are going to forfeit the lands they've held for hundreds of years? They'll do as I say. And if they refuse, 
Then we'll crush them. Exactly. Civil war. I'll not sign any order for Richter's dismissal. The subject is closed. Very well. Farada. Yes, Your Highness? My son has refused our petition. You may tell the Lords their case is hopeless. Farada, are you in this too? Your Majesty, I confess I was. But now I question the wisdom of dismissing Cardinal Richelieu. After all, he is the most popular man in France. What's that? You forget yourself, Farada. The king is the most popular man in France. If you say so, sire. If you are, Louis, why do the Cardinal's morning's receptions attract all the nobility of the court? Why is his palace thronged and yours practically deserted? Palace? A churchman? Palaces should belong to royalty. You forget he is now as wealthy as you. His new palace is far more regal than yours. Is this true, Barada? Must I speak, sir? I order you. Richelieu's palace. Have you seen it? It is quite spacious. About twice the size of your palace here. They say the gold plate is the finest of its kind. The porcelain brought overland from the east. That will be enough. I think I understand, Count Barada. You and all the others. You're jealous of Richelieu's power. Sire, you know you have my allegiance. If it seems good to you to take my small domains for the benefit of France, I surrender willingly. I don't question your majesty's right. All I do ask is why the lands were taken from some nobles and not from others. What do you mean? The edict applied to all the feudal lords. Except the Duke of Normandy, sire. At least it would seem so. For Normandy still has his lands and his armies, while ours have been confiscated to the crown. Are you suggesting that Richter has favored the Duke of Normandy? I suggest nothing, sire. I merely point out that Normandy's domains are untouched, and that Richelieu has just built himself a palace. A palace so that he and the Capuchin monk Joseph might live their days in splendor. All this magnificence for two priests. The money must have come from somewhere, Your Majesty. Well, Louis, you see... Be quiet! Let me have that order of dismissal. Here, Your Majesty. I shall study this carefully. You have only to sign here, Louis. The pen, Your Majesty. May I be allowed to enter? <gasps> Richelieu. I have a feeling that I am the subject of this absorbing debate. Secret entrances, eavesdropping. This is intolerable. Richelieu. Why this sudden and secret return? I hurried to you on my arrival, knowing your majesty was sick. Yes, sick of your presumption and insolence. I am reassured. I feared it might be worse. Madame is well? As well as your presence allows. I have seldom seen Madame look better. You have ridden with unaccustomed haste, my lord cardinal. Your holy office must make great demands on your powers. It does, Count Baradar. And your powers make great demands on my holy office. Now, now, have done with this. I've heard serious charges against you, Cardinal. A minister who does not make enemies is failing in his duty to his king. Thanks to you, we face a threat of civil war, it seems. Where do you hear that? On all sides. Oh, uh, from Queen Anne on your right, uh, Queen Mary on your left, and my friend Barada, yes, on all sides. I understand you've not taken over the Duke of Normandy's lands. Is this true? Quite true, Your Majesty. And may I ask why? I will tell you why. Normandy's lands would constitute a fine addition to Your Majesty's domain. They are rich and broad. But Normandy's armies are greater than yours. Give us time to match his strength, and we'll have his lands uh, merely by threat. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Baradad, does that seem reasonable? <laughs> Very reasonable, sire. Your Majesty is to build up a great army so that we may declare war on our own people. Your Majesty, my sole aim is to make France a great power. These petty kingdoms must be brought under one hand, not a hand with fingers forever outstretched, but one that can close and become a male fist capable of striking back. With a united France, your Majesty will go down in history as Louis of glorious memory. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> that should be worth working for, Barada. Your Majesty, no one would be happier than I to see our country with one throne, one monarch, and uh, one palace. Ah, yes, this, this palace, Richelieu. Why do you call it a palace? Yeah, because it is a palace, Your Majesty. I'm not sure that I approve of this display. Gold plate, I hear. <laughs> Porcelain from the East. Uh, treasures from the remotest worlds brought to France for the pleasure and profit of France. Of France? Of Richelieu, I think. I'm sure Your Majesty will approve the gardens. 
the terraces. The avenues of Roman marble and glittering fountains. Your appreciation fills me with pleasure. And when my plans are completed, I trust my palace will be finer than any your majesty possesses. But, but, but I... Since your majesty has showered honors upon me, it has been my desire to make some concrete return to my benefactor. And so I have built a palace that shall outshine that of any monarch in Europe. And I bring your majesty this deed of gift and beg that you will accept it with its treasures from east and west, its marbles, its terraces, as a token of love and loyalty from your humble servant. But Amo, this is magnanimous. Your majesty will permit me uh, to withdraw. Ah, uh, uh, this document on your table. Uh, this, I am sure, is my formal dismissal from your service. When my work is finished, I beg you to sign it so that I may retire to some simple home where I may walk in my garden and commune with my God. Until then, I take the liberty of withholding it from your hand. You may take it, Armour. I, I fear I was hasty. I thank your majesty. If you need me, you will find me at my palace. Uh, pardon, at your palace. I shall be working there, as always, in the interest of the crown. Your Majesty's a good day. Enemies of the state, enemies of the state, take these warrants, Father Joseph. I've signed them. What else is there? Another Huguenot noble to be arrested on suspicion. Ha! When will they learn, Joseph, that only a united France can be a great France? Who is he? His name is André de Pont. Has he had fair and proper warning? Yes. First all means to conciliate, and then all means to crush. Give me the warrant. England is dangerously friendly towards the Huguenots. Yes. We must stir up trouble between the English and the uh, Scotch. That will keep England busy. Uh, see, Joseph, uh, my map of Europe. The pattern is perfect. With our Swedish mercenaries, we can protect ourselves against Austria, move against Spain. <laughs> I see no loophole, no vulnerable point anywhere. Nor do I. Uh, unless we should meet opposition in our own forces. Yes, true. Some of our noble lords are not too anxious to serve their king. The Count Barada in particular, I'm afraid. I think he'll bear watching, Joseph. Oh, Mr. Gray, what do you say? Uh, she agrees. It's a pity we can't use Miss Degree, Joseph. She has such beautiful claws. <laughs> Miss Degree. Who put this ribbon on you? It must have been Lenore. Ah, Lenore. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, Joseph, you are my oldest friend and I need your sound advice. Uh, what are we to do with that child? I hadn't thought. I suppose you'll present her at court. No. No. A court's no place for young girls. <laughs> now that she's left the convent, she's my responsibility. But we must give her something to amuse her. She's no longer a child, you know. She's too old for dolls, of course. Oh, yes. What about a horse? A horse? <laughs> yes. Now, don't go and get her a charger, Joseph. Just a quiet mare that she can ride with safety. Children who have nothing to occupy them may get into mischief. Mischief? <laughs> no, not Lenore. Yeah, even Lenore. She'll be in her garden. Ask her to see me in my study. Very well, Armand. You sent for me, dear guardian. Well, Lenore, come in, my child. Well, what have you been doing this afternoon? Oh, oh, uh, nothing of importance. What have you been doing? Hmm? Mine is a life of contradictions. I pray for peace and salvation and send men to their death. I flatter kings, amass worldly wealth, 
and pray God to be merciful, and I make men hate me. My father loved you. You were smiling when I came in. What were you reading? <laughs> my diary. When I was young, I wrote down words of guidance for my own conduct. <laughs> Let me see. I don't recommend them to you or to others. When I came to court, I wrote this. I was 21. Speak as little as possible. Withdraw adroitly without lying when the truth is dangerous. The king loves to be praised. <laughs> if you have purpose, pursue it. If you believe deeply, act boldly. Ah, well, 21. If you believe deeply, act boldly. What would you write for yourself? Questions, perhaps, without <laughs> answers. <laughs> what questions? Is it possible to fall in love with someone after seeing them only once? You shall tell me the answer. Is it possible? Yes. Whom have you seen? You've only been out of the convent three weeks. When I was in the convent, the girls used to throw silly notes over the wall to young men. I did it too. A young officer. He passed again. He was very handsome. And I threw another note. And then one day... He threw back an answer. Well? And today I met him. How often have you met him? Only once. Today. And you think you love him? I'm sure. His name? André Dupont. André Dupont. Does he know that the Cardinal Richelieu is your guardian? No. No, he doesn't know about you. He doesn't even know my name. You're quite sure of that? Oh, yes. What is it? What's that paper? André Dupont. Oh, do you know him? I've heard of him. But why do you look so... Well, Joseph? His Majesty is here. His Majesty? With half the court, I should think. What does he want? He says he's come to see his palace. Uh, he wastes no time. Splendid, splendid. See those paintings, Baradar. Masterpieces, every one. Ah, uh, Richelieu. Armand. Your Majesty... Welcome to your palace. It is all that you claimed for it, Armand. A magnificent gift. When does His Majesty take uh, possession? When oh. it is finished, called Baradar. Of yes. course, Baradar. When it is finished. Uh, Armand, I was thinking... Ah. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> who is this? Your Majesty. Charming. Charming. <laughs> who are you, child? Uh, she is the daughter of an old friend and loyal subject who was killed in the service of France. I have made myself responsible. Ah, yes. Uh, well, well, my child, we, we must see you at court on occasion. Would you like that? If I am permitted, Your Majesty. I give you permission. You'll bring her, Richelieu? Of course. When? Whenever Your Majesty commands. Bring her tomorrow. We shall look forward to seeing you tomorrow. You may leave us now, Lenore. Yes, Your Eminence. Your Majesty. Good day, my child. Hmm. A lovely creature, Your Majesty. I have eyes, Parada. I have eyes. Where has she been, Amo? Oh, at the convent. She's still a child. Uh, come, Your Majesty. I want you to see the Roman marble. Yes, yes, yes. Presently. <laughs> a child, you say? You forget how young people grow up. You can't possibly keep her cooped up in this palace of yours. I think the coop is big enough. No, no. I've taken a great interest in her. She should come to court. We must find a husband for her. Your Majesty's interest touches me deeply. She should have a title, position. I think the right man might be the, uh, the Count de Saint-Marc. Saint-Marc? Have you anything against my choice? Oh, is Your Majesty asking me to marry the Count? No, don't be obstinate. He has wealth, a good title. Does Your Majesty deem it necessary to consult Saint-Marc? Saint-Marc will do as he's told. Is it possible, sire, that there are... Other reasons for your interest? Are you daring to suggest? Sire, I may accustom myself to the caprices of monarchs, but I will not pander to their vices. Do you forget that I am still your king? And I am your cardinal, responsible for your immortal soul. When my time comes, I'll answer for that. I demand that you bring her to court. I am sorry. Will you obey your king? No, your majesty. Very well. We shall see how far the power of the cardinal will carry without the support of his king. Well, Joseph? The king's very angry. Yes. See, Joseph, 
on what little things the fate of nations depends. A few hours ago, I said there were no loopholes, and now the history of France may be changed by a pretty face. If I could only find some way to keep Lenard out of his reach. But how? You can't send her away. He'd never forgive you. Joseph. Yes? Joseph. I have an idea. A mad, wonderful idea. Joseph, bring me André de Pont. Sit down. Sit down, Monsieur de Pont. Your guards arrested me. I demand to know why. You are arrested as an enemy to France and an enemy to your king. I am an enemy neither to my king nor my country. But if you think I'll purchase my freedom by allegiance to you, you're mistaken. You join with the Dukes of Normandy, Lorraine and the others that you might defy me. Haven't we the right to fight for our lands we've held for centuries? Tell me, who gave your ancestors those lands? The crown. If a crown can give, a crown can take away. It's not the crown who takes them away, but my lord cardinal. Every day you gather more power to yourself. Soon you will have the whole of France in the palm of your hand for your own selfish end. One moment. You're an officer? Yes. You've seen active service? Yes. Does your regiment go into battle a mere rabble without authority or guidance? My regiment is one of the best disciplined in the army. You exact obedience from your subordinates. What sort of an officer should I be if I didn't? And what if they disobeyed you? I should get rid of them. And that, my friend, is my method. Why do you quarrel with it? I was referring to a regiment. I was referring to the enemies of France. Now... Forget your hatred of me for the moment, and let me ask you. Why do I take your lands and those of the great feudal lords? Why? Because to be strong, we must be united. <laughs> We've done well enough for the past few hundred years. What has stood for a century may be destroyed in a night. England and Austria are arming against us. Our own noble lords are in league with Spain, waiting to help them to march on Paris to crush our country and to place a puppet king on our mighty throne. Have you any pride in your country? Do you want to see France in the ascendant, powerful, glorious, supreme? Or do you want to see a country ravaged by foreign invaders? Unity or defeat? Armand. Well? An important message. Monsieur Dupont, wait in that room. And think well of what I have said. Well, Joseph? From the king. Let me see. Mademoiselle Lenoir de Brizac will take up her residence in the palace as lady-in-waiting to Her Majesty the Queen, pending her marriage with the Count de saint mar Signed, Louis Rex. You see, it's hopeless. Perhaps. Send Lenoir to me at once. Go. Monsieur de Pont? Well, what is your answer? They say you're a devil, that you can twist men around your little finger. It's true. I'm ready to serve you. Good. Sit down again. You married? No. Fortunate. You'll have to marry at once. Marry? Patriotism demands sacrifices. For my purpose, it is essential that you should marry at once. You ask me what I will do for my country and then set me the one task that is impossible. Impossible? You haven't seen the lady I've chosen. Nor will I. Oh, uh, you have a lady already. A very charming, no doubt. But you must get rid of her. No. Are you going to let some worthless little creature jeopardize your whole career? You can do what you like. Commit me to the Bastille as you're about to do, but I won't stoop to this. Oh, you're a very violent young man. Uh, tell me, this girl you have in mind, <clears throat> have you known her long? No. Met her often? Uh, once. <laughs> her name? I... I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Here's a man giving up his whole career for a girl whose name he doesn't even know. I'll give you a minute to change your mind. No. Once this order is signed, I shall not recall it. Well? I've made my decision. Nothing you can do or say will alter it. Father. Brother Joseph said you... <sighs> Eleanor, you mustn't disturb me. I have painful business with this young man. Andre. You? You here? He's a very obstinate man. But, Father, you won't send him away, send please. Send him away? I've been begging him to marry you for the last 15 minutes. But he refuses. Andre! Oh, Lenore, Lenore. You seem to be a most impressionable young man. You fall in love with ladies at a moment's notice. I must leave you. Unless you change your mind again, you'll both meet me in an hour 
in my chapel. Joseph, this is my reply to the king. I'll read it to you. To Louis Rex, your majesty, Mademoiselle Lenoir is honored by his majesty's appointment as lady-in-waiting to the queen, but she humbly suggests that the matter may be delayed until her return from her honeymoon with her husband, André de Pont. Well? Ingenious, but dangerous. Uh, true. Let me add something, Joseph. Uh, something pleasant. Uh, yes. If your majesty desires someone to love, love me. Richelieu. The curtain falls on the first act of Cardinal Richelieu, starring George Arliss. During this brief intermission before Act Two, we bring you the Browning family. It's late afternoon, and Midge comes bursting in from school. Mother! Oh, Mother! Yes, dear? You've got to do something about Bobby. Why, Midge, what's the trouble? Oh, he's incorrigible, Mother. Oh, no. But he is. Tony Allen was walking home with me, and along comes Bobby, and... You gotta run! There, that's just what he yelled at me, Mother, right in front of Tony, and I was so embarrassed. Now, Bobby, that wasn't at all nice. And it was just because I got a run in my stocking, Mother. She's always getting runs. Why, they call her runaway Miss. Well, after all, I can't help it. You certainly can, dear. You can do a lot better than you're doing if you'd only use Lux Flakes. Well, maybe it is my fault. I, I did forget to use Lux. But anyhow, can't you make Bobby stop talking that way? Well, the quickest way to stop him, dear, is to cut down on runs. If you just remember to Lux your stockings every night, you won't have nearly so much trouble. Oh, Mother, I will try to remember. Yes, Luxing stockings after every wearing cuts down on runs and saves many embarrassing moments. Lux saves the elasticity that helps your stockings wear longer and fit better. Cake soap rubbing or soaps with harmful alkali are likely to weaken elasticity and then runs come easily. Give your stockings regular Lux care and all your underthings too to keep them fresh and dainty and to help them stay new looking longer. Lux has no harmful alkali. It's safe for anything safe in water alone. And a little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. Buy Lux Flakes in the economical large size box. And now, Mr. DeMille. Cardinal Richelieu, starring George Arliss with Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero, Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbro. <laughs> With his ward Lenore safely married to André de Pont, Richelieu turned again to affairs of state. By his order, the army of France, commanded by Marshal Le Moyne, stands ready to leave Paris to meet the invading Spaniards at the border. But the cardinal's enemies have other plans. Secretly in league with the Spanish king, Barada has conspired to keep Le Moyne's forces in Paris, knowing that such a move will mean victory for Spain and the establishment of a weak king on the throne of France. With the Duke d'Orléans on the throne, we will soon regain our privileges, gentlemen, and our lands. Agreed, Baradar, mm. but first, Spain must be victorious. They will be. Their forces will advance through Corby and surround Paris. Unless Le Moyne's army meets them halfway before they reach the walls of Paris. Have no fear of that. Le Moyne's army will never leave Paris. I will have public opinion stirred to prevent it. Our day, gentlemen, is at hand. In the palace, King Louis stands by a window, listening to the distant cries. On one side is Barada, and on the other, Louis's brother, Gaston, the weak-willed Duke d'Orléans, whom the nobles hope to place on the throne. Listen to them. They sound half mad. They're clamoring for something, the pigs. What is it, Barada? They want protection. You know, sire, what will happen if the army leaves Paris. The people will revolt. What? Well, why doesn't Richelieu do something? He's the minister of war. You'll forgive me, sire, but it's Richelieu's order that is sending the army away from the city. I will protect my people. 
Tell Marshal Lemoyne to let the army remain in Paris. Defend Paris to the last. Give the order yourself, Gaston. I? Oh, yes, yes. I'll give the order with pleasure, brother. What is it, Mr. Gray? Life too quiet for you here? Like to go to court, eh? Well, a cat may look at a king, but I don't advise it, Mr. Gray. Marshal Lemoyne, his eminence is resting. His eminence will see me, Father Joseph. Lemoyne? Why are you here? Why haven't you and your army left Paris? Stopped. The army's to stay. By whose orders? The king's. Without consulting me. He believes Paris to be France. He's frightened of the people. If I move out of the troops, he's afraid it means revolution. If you stay, it means defeat. If the Spanish army reaches Corby ahead of you, they'll be at the gates of Paris in a week. Whereas if you push on to Corby... No, no, no. Once I trap them in the hills round Corby, I have them on my word as a soldier. It shall be done. Master your men and make for Corby. But the king's order... I am minister of war. Officially, I have not been consulted. I give you the order to march. One moment. I'm a soldier, but I'm also a man. I want to keep my head on my shoulders. And I want to keep my hand on their throat. I can't disobey an order of the king. Let me see that order. This forbids you to take the army out of Paris. That's clear enough. Lemoyne, if the army is delivered to you outside the walls of Paris, will you lead them then? Outside? Yes. The well, army will meet you outside the walls of Paris by midnight at the East Gate. I'll lead them myself. I will be there to meet you. God speed to you and a swift victory. Armand, Louis will be furious. I have one consolation, Joseph. You can separate me from only one head. The insolence of Richelieu. Gets on a horse and marches the army away from Paris in defiance of my orders. In any other person, it would be regarded as treason. Treason? What else is it but treason? Dismiss him, sire. I will. But no, no. Always when he disobeys me, I... I have a fatal feeling that he may be right. But, Your Majesty... That's enough. You may leave, Count Farida. Very well, sire. Guard. Count Farida. Where is Prince Gaston? With the Queen Mother, my lord. The prince is waiting for you. No, no. Surely even Louis won't stand this last insult. This time, Richard has gone too far. Farida, well? The king will do nothing. Nothing? There's a king for you. His own orders defied, a slap in the face, and, and he does nothing. I, I'd have that man's head. My son, you must calm yourself. We've failed again. I shall never become king. Shh, Gaston. You know you were always my favorite. It will all be in good time. I, I shall be king one day, shan't I? You, you promised it. I, I shall. Very soon. Our treaty with Spain. It's almost arranged. Merida, won't you? Why don't you do something? This monster, Richelieu, will crush us. Kill him. <laughs> Haven't we got men enough? I'll, I'll kill him myself. I, I will kill him. Merida, poor Gaston is mad with rage. He talks sense in his madness. Are you mad too? No one can kill Richelieu. You can't risk it. We can risk another man. Someone who might kill him, not for political reasons. We'd never be suspected. But who? There's a young Huguenot noble here. He's being held prisoner by the king. I'll go and have a talk with him. Why am I being held here, Barada? Why is there no message from the cardinal? The cardinal? Andre, don't rely on him. Why not? Is it possible you're so blind? Blind? My poor Andre. Don't you see that you've been used by Richelieu? What do you mean? Doesn't it strike you as curious that he married you in such great haste? It was to save Lenore from the king. From the king or for the king? What? Oh, I don't believe it. The lady found favor in the eyes of royalty. For appearances, her husband had to be found quickly. The cardinal found you willing, ready to hand. No man could be such a fiend. No? Then why doesn't he send you word? Why? Parada, you must help me. I will gladly. But you must help yourself too. Richelieu must die. (laughs) 
My child, my child. <laughs> and then they arrested him, Father. He's there now at the palace. They wouldn't let me see him. And it's all through me. <laughs> Louis is angry because Andre married me. Not because he married you, but because he protects you. You will intercede for him. The king shall set him free or answer to his cardinal. But when? Tomorrow, my child. Go to your room, my dear, and try to sleep. Who's there? Who's there, I say? Joseph, is that you? Light the candle, Joseph. Joseph! It is not Joseph, my lord. Andre, my son. I thought you were under arrest. You meant me to be under arrest, but I'm free. I've come here to kill you. What madness is this? The fine fool you made of me, my lord. A mock marriage. How sweet and holy your eminence looked. How noble. And all the while you were planning to use her to regain the king's favor. What are you saying? Who has been pouring this poison into your ears? They were right. They told me not to wait, but to strike at once. They. Ha ha. They. They have made you that too. Barada again. Barada's my friend. Lenore is at the palace where you sent her. They lie. Lenore is here. Let me pass that I may call her. A trick. She's not here. You want to call your guards. Then go yourself. Lift the latch of that door and call Lenore. Well, why do you hesitate? I'm a fool. You'll trick me, I know it. But you tempt me with her name. You know that, Judas. Call her. Lenore. It's a trick. I knew it. Did someone call? <gasps> Whose voice was that? It's not... Andre. Lenore. You see, my son. Oh, father. Father, forgive me. What's that? The signal. I forgot to give the signal. They're breaking in. Who? Barada. Quick, Lenore, go back to your room. Stay here. Yes, Father. I'll hold them off. Stay. You stay with me. But, Father... Do as I say. What? Now, listen. When they come in, the deed is done. You understand? You've killed me. Strangled me. Keep them off. Don't let them touch me. Now, set the stage. See... I'm in bed, my hand outstretched. So, my beads knotted about my throat. So, they're coming. Draw the curtain. Shh, quiet. Andre, here, Barada. Richelieu, where is he? See for yourself. Barada, look, the bed. He was asleep. I strangled him. I left no trace. Yes! Dead! France is free at last. Well, there's no need to wait now. We can put our plan into action at once. Remove those beads, Andre, and meet us in the courtyard. There's no time to waste. Hurry, Andre! Father, you were wonderful. It was a great effort. I never felt less dead. Andre, a plan they spoke of. What plan? To depose Louis and place Gaston on the throne. Ah? Uh, the Queen Mother and the Queen are on their way to the Spanish border tonight. To visit her brother? Yes, but in reality they carry a treaty, a private treaty. A signed treaty? Yes, signed by Barador, Gaston, and the rest. Ah, oh, the fools. They put their names on paper, their signatures. Arma, what is it? Victory, Joseph. You'll come with me. Quickly, my carriage, my fastest horses. Send gallopers ahead on the route to the Spanish border to warn my men at every village, every tavern to look out for a royal carriage bearing the Queen and the Queen Mother. At last, their signatures. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. So ends Act Two of Cardinal Richelieu with George Arliss, 
and our all-star cast. We'll go into Act Three after this short intermission, during which Mr. DeMille takes us behind Hollywood scenes and introduces our guest of the evening. Hollywood can boast of many researchers and many costume directors, but as far as I know, Edward P. Lambert is our only expert equally at home in either field. Twenty-five years ago, Mr. Lambert helped in costuming and research for the birth of a nation. His silver anniversary finds him manufacturing costumes for another picture based on the war between the states, Gone with the Wind. Now with Selznick International Studio, this versatile gentleman worked with George Arliss at uh, 20th Century Studio when Cardinal Richelieu was brought to the screen. Our play tells us about Richelieu the statesman. Can you, Mr. Lambert, shed any light on Richelieu the man? Well, it's interesting to note that this most important man in France was quite proficient on the lute and would play tunes by the hour. His favorite pets were kittens. When they grew up into cats, he'd get a batch of new ones. Richelieu seldom showed it, but scarcely a day went by when he was free of pain. He suffered almost constantly from terrific headaches. Hmm. You probably acquired one or two yourself, prying into the court secrets of the time. But it was worth it to learn such facts as these. King Louis was very fond of cooking, but often his own dishes gave him such indigestion he'd have to leave the table and go to bed. <laughs> Silk stockings were very fashionable for both men and women, but were so costly that the Queen of France never hesitated to wear ones that had been darned. Here's a beauty treatment of Richelieu's time. To keep skin white, ladies used a mixture with the following ingredients. Fowl's flesh, goat's milk, lemons, camphor, borax, white lead, rose water, and essence of bean flour and newly laid eggs. Wow. And how did the men look after their looks? Listen to what the Duke of Buckingham wore at a ball in Paris. A satin suit with a beautiful gold lace collar embroidered with bands of pearls. A chain of pearls hung six times around his neck. A jewel girdle worth 30,000 crowns. And in his ear, a huge diamond which nobody could see because his long curls covered it up. In connection with costumes, Mr. DeMille, I'd like to say a word about Lux Flakes. Lux is one of the standbys of my department. Costumes, while they're made originally for one picture, may be worn by other players many times. We found that regular care with Lux Flakes keeps them in the finest condition possible. They last longer and look better, so I can personally recommend Lux Flakes for regular home use. There will be about 5,000 new costumes in Gone with the Wind, and all the washable ones will soon be introduced to Lux. What's your biggest problem in manufacturing costumes for Gone with the Wind? So far, the corn shuck hats. During the war, southern ladies were so impoverished that they made bonnets of green corn shucks. When it came time to make them for the picture, I discovered that California's crop had all been harvested. After traveling all over the state, we finally found a little Mexican who had planted his crop of corn so late he couldn't get rid of it. He was tickled to death to sell us all the green shucks we needed. And that, uh, sometimes, is how hats and motion pictures are made. Goodbye, <laughs> Mr. DeMille. Shucks, Mr. Lambert. Goodbye. <laughs> we set the scene for the third act of Cardinal Richelieu, starring George Arliss with Florence Arliss, Cesar Romero, Heather Angel, Montague Love, and Douglas Dumbro. Carrying a secret treaty with Spain, Marie de Medici and Queen Anne race madly toward the border, the royal coach swaying and bouncing on the rutted road. A few miles behind, another coach, bearing the arms of Cardinal Richelieu, races in swift pursuit. At all costs, Richelieu must gain possession of the treaty, bearing the signatures of the traitors to the king. Leaning from the window, Richelieu shouts to the coachman. Coachman! Yes, my lord. Tell the outrider to take the horse trail that goes through Florida to Cumia. The innkeeper there is one of my men. Have him make some excuse to delay the Queen's coach. Very, very good, my lord. More delay, more delay. Anne. Did you notice that rider who came up on the road and then passed on? Only some lackey asking the way. And shortly after, there was this delay. There's nothing mysterious about it. The innkeeper told us the roads are unsafe after the rain. Come in. You, you, your majesties, I, I, there's Cardinal Richelieu. Richelieu? Yes, he requests an audience with you. He, he says... Here that my regiment of guards is well looked after. Feed them well. Ah. Your Majesties. My Lord Cardinal. 
Her Majesty, I'll not waste words. You know why I'm here. How dare you? What do you mean by breaking in upon us like You're this? You're carrying a secret treaty to the King of Spain. I want it. Your mind sees intrigue in every corner. I have no in no treaty. Why fence with me? Where is it? We have no treaty. No? Well, I have a warrant for your arrest on a charge of high treason. A warrant signed by the king. Unless you surrender the treaty at once, I shall order my guards to enforce it. Give it to me. I will not. Ah, then you have it. <laughs> if your names are not signed to it, why not give it up and save yourselves? Because I will not betray those whose names are signed They're to. already betrayed. You might as well know that your plot will be blown to the skies. Baradar will be taken prisoner, the Dukes of Normandy, Lorraine and the others are in full flight, and Gaston, your favourite, may have to face his brother on a charge of regicide. There's nothing of that in the treaty. You have the means of proving that. Come now. The treaty is in this box here, isn't it? Why not give it to me? You'll find it better to have me your friend than your enemy. Well... Devil. But still your friend. Take it. Uh, thank you, your highness. Ah, the names. Verada. Gaston's signature wobbles nervously, and no wonder. Your Majesty, I will send my guard to escort you unofficially to Spain. We have our carriage. We shall go back to Paris. I would spare the king the surprise of your sudden return. His heart is weak, and the surprise of my return will, I believe, be as much as he can bear. You see, the noble lords have already told him that I am dead. They'll be gathering soon in solemn council, hovering like vultures round his throne, smirking behind his back as they wait for him to sign his own death warrant. Now, that mustn't be for Louis or for France. And so, I know you'll excuse me. Good night, Your Majesties, and a pleasant trip uh, to Spain. The king will be here at any moment, gentlemen. Has he been informed of Richelieu's death? Baradar thought of that. It was for the good of the country. Didn't you know? Richelieu was plotting the king's death. <laughs> we well, knew, didn't we, Gaston? Oh, yes, yes, we knew. <laughs> well, gentlemen, the stars tell us of great changes this month, eh? No need for stars to tell us that, Your Highness. Ah, the King's throne. <laughs> it looks very comfortable. I wonder what it would feel like to sit in it. Uh, Your Highness. Oh, there's no harm, Baradar. <laughs> Coming events, you know. His Majesty... Louis, King of France! Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, Your Majesty. My lords, overshadowing all events of the day is the news of Armand de Plessis, Cardinal Richelieu. With his death, many changes will come into effect at once. Oh, yes, brother. Already we have decided to revoke the edict confiscating your lands and rely on the loyalty and service of the feudal lords. What? We ourselves intend to rely for advice and guidance on our good friend, Count Baradar. Your Majesty. And upon the services of our brother, Gaston. Uh, you may depend on me, uh, so long as you reign. And we rely upon you, my lord, for advice in your various offices. If we seem to pass over the death of the Cardinal lightly, it is that we have evidence that he was planning something of such treasonable nature that were he alive today to answer for it, his life would be forfeited. His Eminence, the Cardinal Duke de Richelieu. Your Majesty, my lord. Richelieu, how comes this report of your death? Sir, the attempt was made. It was well conceived and well planned. But Providence elected, I should be spared to be of service to you once more. You deny this plot against my life, against the throne? Not only do I deny it, sir, I am here to inform your majesty of the details. His majesty is already informed of the details, my lord. His majesty is too wise to take the word of an assassin or the word of a traitor. I speak of Count Baradar and the Duke d'Orléans. You dare accuse my friend and my brother? 
Where is your proof? Where is now? His whole life, your majesty, is all the proof you need. Cardinal, we have suffered too much from your arrogance. I'll tolerate it no longer. I believe implicitly in the devotion and loyalty of my friends. I order the arrest of the Cardinal Duke de Richelieu. Sir, I have here a Gentlemen treaty. Gentlemen of the King's order, arrest him. Stand back. Take him, I tell you. Back. Stripped of all rank and authority, I carry still a mightier power. I face you now as a priest of God, round whom I draw the circle of sanctuary of our solemn church. Set foot upon that holy ground, and on your head, even though it were a crown, I'll call down the curse of Rome. Your Majesty, you believe me guilty. If I have conspired, as they say, against your life, what punishment, sire, would you declare fit for the instigator of such a crime? A sentence of death. Then read this, sir. Read it. A treaty with Spain. A treaty which would ultimately depose your majesty and set your brother on the throne. And see there whose names are signed to it. Armand. Armand. You have served me again. Your majesty. May I have leave to speak from beside your throne? My lords, nobles of France, from this day forward and forevermore, France is united into one great kingdom. All power is vested in one central authority, one absolute ruler, His Majesty King Louis XIII. And I am his shadow. Armand, I am going to the chapel. Your Majesty, I shall go with you. We'll pray together, my son. And for thee and for France, make me merciful and strong, kind and just. In thy blessed name I ask it, for the glory of God and the glory of my country. ends tonight's presentation of Cardinal Richelieu, starring George Arliss, who returns in a moment for a curtain call. But before he comes back, I want to ask you a question. How do you judge a woman's age? Well, here's how one man answers that question. He's Ned Weyburn, the famous theatrical producer who has launched hundreds of stage and screen stars. He says your hands, more than your face, tell your age. Stop and think for a moment. He's right, isn't he? Don't smooth white hands look a lot younger than rough red ones? Yes, they do, Mr. Ruick. But think of all the women who wash dishes every day. Doesn't that roughen hands terribly? Yes. When you use strong soaps, soaps that contain harmful alkali, your hands are apt to get rough and red, all right. But there's no need for that, you know. Why not take the advice of beauty experts who recommend Lux for dishes? because it protects your hands in the dishpan and leaves them soft and smooth. There's no harmful alkali in mild, pure Lux flakes to irritate your skin and roughen your hands, and it costs so little to use these beauty suds for your dishes. A little goes so far, Lux is thrifty. So why not use it for all of the soap and water jobs you have around the house to give your hands the protection they deserve? Buy the economical large size box of Lux flakes. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. In all his brilliant career, George Arliss has performed for radio audiences only three times, and each time on the stage of the Lux Radio Theater. 
It's with pride then, as well as gratitude, that I extend our microphone so that we may hear Mr. Arliss now as himself. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. I'm sure you'll all be glad to know uh, Mr. DeMille is once more looking uh, himself. <clears throat> uh, since we gave our last broadcast in this theater, my wife and I have been on a visit to England. In returning to the Luxor, we have a pleasant feeling that we are meeting our last year's audience as old friends. The enormous number of people that may listen in is still rather awe-inspiring to me. And when Mr. DeMille whispered to me just before we began that he estimated our audience at well over 15 million people, I found the thought staggering. On many evenings, I have listened to the Lux Radio Theatre and have been gratified by the fact that this theatre has faithfully lived up to its great responsibilities. I feel a certain satisfaction that the sponsors of the Lux Radio Theatre selected Richelieu for this evening because a play of this kind has the added value of stimulating an interest in some of the most dramatic and entertaining periods of history. May I extend my affectionate regards to my old friends, my audiences of the stage and screen. Good night. Our producer comes back in just a moment with grand news about the stars and play you'll hear a week from tonight. In Cardinal Richelieu, you heard Ivan Simpson as Joseph, Doris Lloyd as Queen Anne, Walter Kingsford as Gaston, David Torrance as Marshal Lemoyne, John Burton as Brugnon, Dennis Green as Lorraine, Eric Snowden as Olivares, Frank Nelson as Guard, Lionel Bellamore as Innkeeper, John Toti as Coachman, and Lou Merrill as Usher. Cesar Romero, a 20th century Fox star, is seen shortly with Shirley Temple in The Little Princess. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of the same studio where he directed music for the new film, Jesse James. Heather Angel's new picture is Paramount's Bulldog Drummond's Secret Police. Join the March of Dimes and help to stamp out infantile paralysis. Just put 10 cents in an envelope and mail to the president at the White House to fight the terrible disease. Your dime and the dimes of millions of others will help crippled children walk again. Mr. DeMille. That sage of the hinterlands, that cracker barrel philosopher, that champion of the folks back home, stars next Monday night in the Lux Radio Theater, Mr. Bob Burns. We'll hear the <laughs> horn-blowing pride of Van Buren in his most recent and best-loved screen portrayal. The Arkansas Traveler. Our play is the homespun story of a wandering printer. And starring with Bob, as she did in the picture, is one of Hollywood's most popular and talented character actresses, Miss Faye Bainter. And also from the original cast, the dainty and delightful Jean Parker. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Bob Burns and Faye Bainter in The Arkansas Traveler with Gene Parker. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Tonight's presentation came to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, those mild, pure soap flakes safe for anything safe in water alone. Be with us then next Monday. Be part of the large audience that gathers each week to hear Hollywood's favorite stars and the most popular plays of stage and screen. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>